Hello and welcome to another episode of One on One. Our guest today on One on One is Antonia Ojenagbo. She's a TEDx speaker, a sexual abuse survivor, a rape survivor advocate, and a rape recovery specialist. Thank you for joining us, Tonya. You're welcome. Okay, so before we go on to the interview, I wanted us to start with this, for you to define for us what sexual abuse is. A lot of people do not understand it. Many people just throw the word around and don't understand the deep meaning. So what is sexual abuse? Sexual abuse is an abusive sexual behavior carried out by one person on another person, preferably by an adult upon a minor, a child. A minor is someone that is below the age of 18. And sexual abuse can also be showing pornographic materials to children. Mm. That is also sexual abuse. When an adult shows a, a child that is below the age of 18 his or her naked private parts, that is also sexual abuse, yes. When an adult touches a child, a child's genitals, a child's private area, that is also sexual abuse. All right. Oh, wow. Okay, thank you so much for defining that. So now let's get to your story. Um, you were sexually abused as a child. Can you tell us that story? Okay, um, I was sexually abused by my uncle. So I had come to Lagos to stay with him because uh, my parents couldn't afford to take care of us. Okay. So one night as I was sleeping, I felt a hand touch my breast and the hand moved from my breast to my vagina. And wow. Now, I didn't know who was doing this to me. At first, I didn't know the person that was doing this to me, and he would do that to me every night. Were you he sleeping would... in the room alone? No, 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 I wasn't. But okay. th because there's no light in the room, okay. so I never knew who was doing this to me. The person would come fiddle with my um, vagina and play with my nipples, play with my breasts and all that. But one day, my uncle said to me in the morning that if you ever tell anybody what's going on, I'll kill you. Wow, how old were you at this time? I was 12. Wow. So it was at that point that I was able to put a face to the monster, like I call it, because I thought a monster was actually coming every night, you know, because I never knew who this person was. So, but the day I found out it was my uncle and it really broke my heart. I was really disappointed because I used to call him daddy. Mm. Yes. And how long did this abuse go on for? From 1992 till 1998. Wow. That's six years. Yes. So how did he end? What happened? What, what you know? What changed? And look, I have so many questions. In that six years, can you just take us through the journey? Sorry that I'm, I'm no, let it, having to yes. let you relieve in, in, this in, moment. In, no, it's okay. In, in that six years, I, I couldn't tell any adults what was going on because my uncle has said that if I say a word to anyone that he was going to kill me, then one day my mom came to Lagos for a, um, a church program and I was asking my uncle's wife for sanitary towels. So my mother now asked my uncle's wife if um, I started saying my menstruation. And my, mother said, my uncle's wife said yes. And they began to make fun of me. You know, and my mom was like, eh? So Antonia is now seeing her period. So with the way they were saying it and making fun of me, my uncle just looked at me, that cynical look that said, I told you, nobody would ever believe you if you say a word. Because he had actually told me that my mom was not going to believe me. Wow. Yes, and for you to know that, when I eventually had the courage to tell my mom, she didn't believe me. In fact, my mother said that God was going to judge me for trying to implicate an innocent man because along the process, my father died and he really, 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 really stood by my mom when my dad died. So it was difficult for me to convince my mother that this person who is this nice mm -hmm. does this to me every night. So, and if you, if you remember, in the 90s, you couldn't talk about sexual abuse. We have so much information now. Nobody told us when we were children that if an adult touches you in your private parts, you should call for help or you should scream or talk to somebody. Nobody told you if an adult comes in the night, raises up your dress and have sex with you in the middle of the night and you wake up and the person tells you, if you say a word, I'm going to kill you. Nobody told us we could talk. And moreover, if you were from a very religious home like my, like my own family, where sex was never discussed. Sex was never discussed in our house. It would be more difficult for you to talk about it. Now, everyone knows that sex is an adult's, is an adult's 
thing for a child to open her mouth to say this is what is happening to me every night in those days the parents will beat that child they will not even believe the child you okay know. sorry to interrupt you i want to just find out so how did the abuse end and how did you get to uh, you know leave leave the family because you were in his care for six years how did the abuse end and how do you get to you know leave the place okay so my friend had invited me to a church and then um, when we got to the church the pastor had said he wanted to see newcomers so when we went to the pastor's office he finished talking to us as we we're about to step out of his office now i would never seen that pastor before that was my first time because that was my first time of going to that church as we we're about to step out of his office he just said antonia wait let the others step out so when everybody went out he said you have something to tell me so I said, I don't have anything to tell you. Now, I don't know this person. And he just looked at me and he said, you want to tell me that your uncle is sexually molesting you and you don't know what to do. So at that point, immediately he said that, I went on my knees and I began to cry. I started crying because for the first time, an adult was going to listen to me. I started crying because I knew that help had come. So he allowed me to cry. He gave me a an handkerchief and he told me to sit down. So he said, do you want it to happen tonight again? I said, no. He said, do you want it to stop? I said, yes. So he said, have you shouted before? I said, no. So he said, you know your dad just died. So this night, when he comes, as he touches you, you're going to scream until his wife wakes up. Wow. And when she wakes up, if they ask you why you are screaming, pretend like you're having a nightmare because your father just died. That was exactly what I did. So when he came that abuse? night, yes. By the following morning, when I screamed, of course, the wife woke up and they were like, what was the problem? So I said I was having a bad dream. So in the morning, he just looked at me, he hissed, and he walked away. That was the end of the physical abuse. And you were still living in, under his roof? Yes, I was, because I had nowhere to go to. I was there until I got married. Okay, so tell me about this. Um, you must have gotten a lot of backlash because you mentioned earlier about how your mother did not even believe um, yeah. your story. So how did you handle the backlash? There must have been a lot of backlash from the family because look, the story is in public now. Is this uncle still alive? Yes, he's still alive. So He might be watching. Oh, wow. <laughs> so what has the uh, backlash been? What was the backlash like then? And even currently now, do you know, has he owned up? Has he come to confess? Has your mother apologized to you? You know, just, I have like a lot of questions. How did you yes. handle family backlash? Okay, one of the things um, sexual abuse did to me was making me become very stubborn. I didn't care about anybody again. I felt that the world had failed me. I felt everyone had failed me. So if I can use the word, I became a sort of, um, sort of a rebel. I became like a rebellious child, very stubborn. Nobody in my family could say a word to me. I would do what I want to do. Okay. So. My family, they talk. They can't do anything to me because of the kind of nature that I have. If I was um, a lily livered person, they would have bullied me to silence because my family is a Christian family. They feel irritated right now. They are very disgusted that I've made this story public and I don't care. You know, Has I, your uncle apologized to you? Yes, in 2019, the first Monday in February, he called to apologize because, of course, now... So he has owned up to it? Yes, he has apologized. Did he own up to his family too that he did it or he just to my apologized mom. to you? He called me. Yes, he called me. My mom knows. So my mom now said, since he has called and he has apologized, that I should stop talking about it and let's bury the matter. Let's forgive and forget. But I say to them that now this is beyond me. This has nothing to do with me because I know how this affected my mental health to the extent that I, I was admitted in a psychiatric, in a mental health home, you know. So I found out that you have a lot of adults like myself who were abused as children, who have not healed and is also affecting them mentally so now my story is not because of me it's grown bigger than that it's to encourage other people because your healing actually starts when you begin to talk for me do you know that um 53 percent of the women who have been sexually molested will go to their graves with their secret they would never say it out mm -hmm. and one out of every three girls that you see has gone through one form of sexual violence or the other the psychological and the emotional effects you can't quantify it. The torture, the mental torture that you go through, you never completely heal 100%. The, it's a journey. You get better by the day. You know, you have a little triggers here and there. But you see, it's better to talk about it. When you talk, you get help. 
I didn't know that you could get help. If I knew, that's one of the reasons why I said I would never keep short again. I'll keep talking about this. Because if I knew on time that I could get help, I, I could go for therapy and counseling and become a better person like I am today, I would have started that journey on time. It wouldn't have taken me all that length of time. This, um, it, sometimes sexual abuse can actually, the fact that you're carrying unforgiveness in your mind, it can affect your health, mm -hmm. you know? For 15 years, I was, I, I've been hypertensive. I take medication every day. But the perpetrator has moved on. But you see, the abuse is still stuck in the age of the abuse, That's so which true. is one of the reasons why we are emphasizing that survivors need to get help so that they can heal. It's for yourself. Healing is for yourself. It has nothing to do with the perpetrator. All right, thank you. So we'll just take a quick break. And when we return from the break, Antonia will be telling us how this trauma, you know, affected her life, affected her marriage, and how she almost took her own life. We'll be back right after this break. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us on one on one. I still have Antonia Ojeda with me. So thank you again for sharing your story. I just wanted to find out from you how did this abuse affect your marriage? Okay, it's a long story, but I'll try to make it very, very short. Okay, so after the abuse, I wanted to leave my uncle's house, but my family is a very small family, so there was nowhere I could go to. The only thing that could take me out of that house was getting married. So every available guy that came, I just wanted to get married. Then I finally got married to this guy, and I left my uncle's house. Now, when I was going to get married, I wasn't thinking about um, sex. sex. It never crossed my mind. It never crossed my mind. I just wanted to leave that environment because seeing this person every day was like a bad reminder for me and it was always triggering me. So on the night of the wedding, the night after we got married, the night of the wedding, I said to my husband that um, I'd like to speak with him. So I said to him that please, can we live like brother and sister? And um, he didn't argue with me. He said yes. But he later on told me, yes. He later told me that when I said that, he knew that I needed counseling. Because Had I, you told him about the abuse before the marriage? Yes, I told him about my story. Okay. Yes, so he said immediately he knew. So the following day, he just called a pastor because... In 2003, when I got married, you were no we, counselors. Yes, we never really knew, okay, as a Christian, that you are supposed to talk to a counselor. We just felt everything would be sorted out by pastor. So we spoke to a pastor who spoke to me. I didn't agree. But after some time, one day he said to me, he said, Tonya, I'm not your brother. I'm not your brother. I said, but you agreed. You agreed. It was like how many months into the marriage? Three. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so he, he started begging me. Then the pastor, they called me again. They gave me, they pampered me a lot that day, to call a long story short. And I gave my rules and my regulations, which were very weird. So I said, okay, it will happen, This sex will happen this night. But you see, don't tell me you love me. Don't use any endearments for me. Till today, my husband calls me by my name, Tonya. No endearments, nothing. Because my uncle used to use endearments a lot for me. So it that made me... triggered you. Yes, so endearments trigger me, so... My name is Tonya. He calls me Tonya. So that night I said, you will put out the lights because I didn't want to see your pennies. So after the deed is done, you will tie your towel before you put on the light. Then I said, okay, so when we're sleeping, there's no need to cuddle me. I am not interested in your cuddle. So we have, he had to do, we had to do a very big bed so that there will be no meeting points. So there's nothing like, you're rolling on the bed and you want to cuddle your wife. No, it's not allowed in this hour relationship. And you know, funny enough for me, it's 17 years now. That's how we're used to it. Even till now? Yes. We're okay. used to, unconsciously. Okay, tell me about this because I know, so uh, we now want to go into your journey to recovery. I know you had tried to take your own life and you reached out to um, someone to help you. So tell me about that and your road to recovery because I would have assumed that because you have gone through therapy and you're, you know, rec or you're still currently recovering, things would have uh, improved on that end, you know. Things have improved. Improved. Okay. So please. Things tell us have about improved because formerly I couldn't stay naked before my husband. I would have to wear something. I must wear a pant and a bra. You know, I would 
after having my bath, I can't come out like that. I must wear my pants and my bra because that's what I was used to um, before I, I got married. So now, it's, I said it's a journey because it takes time. It's already in your subconscious. This is how you do things. This is how you do, you do things. So one day, I just said, today is today. I'm still naked, you know. So I called him from the sitting room. And when he came, he was like, oh, Tonya, ah. He was very happy. And I said, I want to, I want to conquer this fear. That he's been very nice to me in all honesty. He's been very nice to me. I can tell you without any iota of doubt that if not for the support of my spouse, I would have been history by now. I can tell you that for sure. Mm -hmm. So when I became suicidal, you know, one of the things sexual abuse does to you is it makes you feel hopeless, worthless. It steals your, your sense of self-worth. You know, you, your self-esteem is zero, minus zero if there's anything like that. You know, you keep seeing your, and you have this self-blame. You keep telling yourself, oh, I cost it. Because we used to go to the church where you wear dresses, turtleneck and all that. I never used to wear trousers. So I used to blame myself that maybe if I was wearing trousers, it wouldn't have been easy for my uncle to just be raising my dress up. So that's self-blame. Then I felt something was wrong with me. So all that self-blame and self-guilt would always trigger and I would spiral and fall into severe bouts of depression. So even after getting married, my husband treats me very well. I started feeling, ah, this guy is very nice. I don't deserve this kind of guy. He's supposed to have a better girl. I'm not a good girl and all that. So I started having this thought. One day I told him, I said, you know what? When I die, I know that um, he works with a senior pastor of my church. I said, I know that pastor will get you a good wife. I said, but you know what? Please do not marry a girl that is as stubborn as Antonia. Marry a girl that is very cool-headed. You know, he gives me the freedom to express myself and do everything else. I want, you know. So I'm like, this guy deserves better. So I started planning that, okay, this life is not worth it. I wasn't emotionally present in the life of my children for me. I wasn't, I was afraid I was not going to be a good mother. Wow. My husband practically brought up the children. He would go for PTA meetings. He would go for open days. The children, the teachers of my children knew my children because I wouldn't go to their school. Sometimes when I'm in that depressive mood, I don't want to talk to anybody. My children learned to write on time. They would write letters. Do your to children, me. sorry to interrupt, do your children know your story? My children know my story. We'll get to that. My children know my story because the first time I shared my story in church, someone in church told her daughter that she couldn't be friends with my daughter again. So my daughter came home and said that to me. And I was just grateful to God. I thank God my children know my story. So my children know my yes. story. So I began to feel worthless, hopeless. I look at my children and I said, no, I don't deserve to have this kind of children. So I said, okay, when I kill myself, at least there will be a good a mother. I called my sister and I said to my sister that if anything happens to me, please help me take care of my children. Oh, and I, wow. Yes, then I have two aunties that I know that, okay, these two aunties come with me, they'll take care of my children for me. So I was going to kill myself. I know I stood in front of my mirror to make up and I heard that voice clearly that said, and so when you finish it up, it's not worth it. You know, but by this time, I started following a psychiatrist online. And one day she had written about getting help for severe depression and suicide thoughts. Okay, I need to interrupt you, Anita. We need to take a quick break. <laughs> well, after the break, we'll continue this conversation. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you for staying with us on 101. Antonia and Jenny Amboa was just sharing her story of how she almost took her life. So you were saying about you were following the psychiatrist online. Yes, I was following her online and I was interested in what she was writing. I think my journey to recovery, I owe it a lot to her because if not for her write-ups on social media, I never knew that you could seek help. You know, so one of those days she wrote about getting help for severe depression and if you are suicidal, that you can get help. I took down her contacts, but I didn't call her. Okay. So by this time, I was already hearing voices. I would hear that voice that would tell me, sometimes when I'm walking on the road, the, boss, the, the voice would tell me that I should just 
run to the middle of the road so that let that car just clear you. You know, I will think how I've disappointed my mom. I'm the first child. My siblings see me as a very strong person. My family thinks, ah, Antonia is an iron lady. But you know, it's just on the outside. This girl is dying inside. So I just felt, okay, if you end it, after all, you have a lot of siblings who will always say, my elder sister is late. I said, okay, my, my siblings will help me take care of my children. So that day, as I stood in front of my mirror and I heard that voice, but deep down, I didn't want to die. So I just reached out to the psychiatrist. I called her and I said, can you give me the address of your office? So she gave me the address. I deleted her phone number from my phone because Why? I knew, because I was ashamed of the fact that my husband will find out that I checked myself into a mental health facility. I was ashamed of the fact that my mother will be disappointed that as a woman leader in church, her child has been admitted in the mental health home. You know, there's this stigma that comes when you say you have mental health issues, you know. So even my house fellowship leader told me one day that, don't, 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 don't say these things again. You know, people will think that you are mad. And I'm like, what? I'm getting, I'm going mad. You know, so, and I was ashamed of the fact that my children will be stigmatized that, oh, your mom is crazy and all that. So I didn't want anybody to find out where I was. So I switched, I deleted her number. I switched up my two phones. I gave the phones to my sister-in-law. I just told her, I said, I'm going to a place where I will not be able to talk to anybody. You didn't even tell your husband. I didn't tell my husband. I was ashamed to tell my husband because my husband has been with me on this journey and he thought I was making progress. So I was ashamed that I disappointed him. So I didn't want him to find out. He works in a church. I didn't want him to be stigmatized that, oh, your wife is in the mental health home. So I thought about all of that. And I said, no, I'm not going to tell anybody. That was the way my mind was working at that time. Okay. So I practically checked myself into that mental health facility. That was where I got help. That's the, one of the reasons why I'm able to sit here boldly, tell you this story, and I'm not breaking down to cry because I've, I've healed. Uh, yes, I've healed. Okay. Yes, you know, your journey to recovery starts when you can tell your story. And you're not telling that story from the place of pain. Mm. I'm not telling you my story again from the place of pain. I'm not bitter towards my abuser. I have moved on. Okay. I think that this led you to starting a support group. Can you tell us more about that um, support group that you started? Okay, after I was discharged from the mental health facility, it just occurred to me that, wow, you have a lot of adults like myself who were abused as children. Some of them haven't spoken about it. You know, there's this thing called the inner child. You are now an adult, but your inner child is crying. That's why you see a 40-year-old girl, when she wants to tell her story of how she was abused at the age of eight, she just begins to cry. It's not a 40-year-old woman who is crying. It's that eight-year-old inner child that is crying for help. You know, so I started a support group for adult survivors like myself who have gone through child sexual abuse and they have not healed. So what we do is we bring therapists, we bring counselors to come talk. Today, they too can start their journey to recovery. Um, no videos, no pictures are allowed except the pictures of the facilitators. Okay, for privacy? Yes, for privacy and confidentiality. People tell their story, so you, uh, they don't want you. Some of them, their families don't even know that um, they've gone through any of that. Then in this part of the world, we have a lot of stories of incest. You know, incest is the most difficult part of sexual abuse to talk about because it is family to family. family. Yes, so you want to present the fact that your family is an honorable family. You, know, you don't need anybody to know that this despicable act is happening in your family. Like my family is a Christian family. That's why you don't understand why I'm talking. You're supposed to be projecting this image. You know, so why are you saying this thing happened in this honorable family? So it's a safe space for survivors where you can meet sister survivors like yourself. You know, you want to, when you're telling your story, if you want to cry, we cry. You know, you cry and you start your journey to recovery because it steals from you. It makes sexual abuse can actually make somebody's life stagnant if the person has not healed. You know, on the outside, it seems like you're growing, but you know mm. that a lot is happening. Okay, um, there's so much, but we have um, such little time. I want you to just give a message to uh, victims, or should I say, you, you call them um, survivors. 
to people who have survived rape or they have not sought for help or are just even just going through you know their own um, journey right now and also to their families to just give a message what message would you like to give to the victims themselves and what message would you like to give to the families to offer support you were lucky to have a very strong um, supportive spouse who supported you through some people don't have that um, yeah. luxury so what message do you have for the victims themselves and for the families so every survivor out there i want you to know that you survived the abuse you will survive the recovery a lot of us are speaking out so that you will know that the shame does not belong to you. The shame actually belongs to the perpetrator. If you live in Lagos State, we have 22 sexual assault referral centers where you can get support all over Nigeria. We have three in Lagos State. So support and counseling is available. You know, we have the Mirabel Center located inside Lassos. Free counseling, free therapy for survivors. All you need to do is just walk up there and they have their phone numbers that you can call. You can look for them on social media also. And to the families, I want you to know that the life of the survivor is very, very important. Now, you do not have to support the perpetrator and stigmatize and shame the abused. The abused really, really needs your support because he or she, because it actually happens to both male, male and female, he or she is going through a lot of psychological effects that they cannot talk about. So all they need is your support, not your castigation. Mm. Thank you so much, Natalia. Thank you so much for um, coming here to share your story, to be brave enough to look at your family, some of your family that have not supported you in the eye, and even to be able to <laughs> embrace you know, other victims and offer them support. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and that's all we can take on one-on-one -on -one today. Please do join us again for the next interesting episode. I'm Fumi Unwajefe.